talk today. Uh, Andrew is with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he will be talking to us about the Northern long eared Bat and Federal Project Review. Andrew has been with the Fish and Wildlife Service for seven years, five of which have been here in the Ecological Office. His title is Ecological Services Field Office Conservation Planning and Assistance Biologist. He's also worked with many other uh, threatened and endangered species throughout the United States. And uh, he let me know that this is an interactive, uh, an interactive talk, so questions are encouraged. And with that, I will leave it over to Andrew. Thank you. Um, yeah, certainly. Anytime questions pop up, feel free to let me know. I really kind of threw this presentation together very last minute between a couple different presentations, so hopefully it's not too choppy. Um, but certainly give a holler if um, I'm not being clear or need anything else explained. Um, to start off, um, I work at the Twin Cities Ecological Services Field Office. Um, there's a lot of them across the country, and we've actually complex with the state of Wisconsin uh, as of two years ago, so we're also handling every project that occurs in Wisconsin as well. Um, we have locations in Green Bay and Madison, but all of our regulatory biologists are now in uh, the Twin Cities office, so if you ever have any involvement with Fish and Wildlife Service on weapon permitting or any sort of federal review, it will likely be coming out of our office. We do, um, just mentioned I'm part of the Conservation Planning Assistance Department. Um, I work with federal agencies to avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts to fish and wildlife resources. A lot of that's done through federal review um, of anything involving federal permits, federal funding, um, any kind of 404 Clean Water Act. Um, that document, that project needs to go through ESA consultation, and I work closely with the core Army Corps of Engineers um, in the review process and make sure that um, both NEPA regulations are met uh, and uh, ESA as well and any other environmental law. Uh, we also do FERC relicenses for dams and that actually provides a pretty good avenue for fish passage. Um, we have a, probably well, three biologists in our Twin Cities office doing environmental contaminants and quite a few in Green Bay and Madison and they work on restoring areas that have been contaminated from past commercial use. Um, probably the, the one closest to here is Round Lake, which is actually a, a wildlife refuge. It's handed over by the, um, the I guess, the military to the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service before there was really an understanding of how um, contaminated that area was. And there's been a lot of negotiation, negotiations back and forth on getting the, the military to yes, get some of that work taken care of. Um, and then endangered species, we have quite a few endangered species biologists, and I also cross over and do uh, that realm um, anytime there's impacts of any federally threatened or endangered species. Uh, we go through the consultation process and assess other federal agencies. And, and then anytime listing and recovery, uh, that's actually kept us pretty busy the office the last uh, two years for sure. Uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, as I said, our range for our office, we have a lot of listed species. But certainly the one that's gotten the most attention recently is the northern long eared bat. Uh, tiny one right up here at the very top. Go a little bit into ecology and um, the biology of the species. Um, it's a medium sized bat, five to eight grams. Um, medium to dark brown, and its characteristic long ears, and that's how we distinguish the species <coughs> from others that um, commonly occupy the same habitats, uh, for trees in the summer and caves in the winter. Um, but actually, if you bend down those long ears, they stick past the, the tragus, which is the, um, I guess here in the images are very good, but the, uh, the nose, um, I mean, that's how we can distinguish that species from, from others. The range of the northern long eared bat, um, very wide ranging, currently occupies um, 37 states and uh, many Canadian provinces. 
um, goes through typical hibernation pattern as most bats do um, during the summer, goes through periods of torpor where they lower their body temperature. Try to use that. We'll um, figure out how the volume works okay. in a second here. Um, can, can everybody hear me now? Is it any better or not? Okay. Uh, how about now? You can see a lot of head nodding is no. It's just the volume up. adjustment is on the back wall. Does anybody know what that is? That's what it says. That's the best. That's the best. Damn. Just stick it really close. Um, during the hibernation process, they lose about 40% of their body weight during hibernation. And when they come out of uh, hibernation in the spring, it's a critical time period for the species because they have to uh, go across the landscape, rebuild their fat reserves at a time where the females are, are pregnant and then find new roost sites um, to, um, to last the, the summer long. And uh, depending on where they are in the range, this could be between September and uh, and uh, April, I'm sure those dates are, are a little bit off. It's the, uh, oh, that would be the, the hibernation period, excuse me. Uh, winter habitat, as I said before, uh, the species hibernates in caves and mines. Um, it has been found in some tunnels, but these aren't considered primary um, hibernacular locations. In Minnesota, um, the main notable ones are uh, Sudan Mine and uh, Mystery Cave. Has pretty good populations. Um, they prefer areas of higher humidity, with lower uh, constant temperatures, and they typically move singly or in small groups. Um, they are actually pretty difficult to detect in the cave setting. They roost in very tight cracks and crevices, um, very deep parts of the cave, and you don't really get the, the typical um, visual that you might get from other bat species where you can walk in and you might see a thousand clustered in a very tight section of the wall. Um, it's one species that's uh, very difficult to detect. Um, this photo is actually one of the rare cases where it is roosting with uh, little brown bats, um, but, but again, not, not very common. Spring staging and fall swarming. Uh, I kind of alluded to that before. Um, critical time period for the, the species to try to rebuild fat reserves. It's usually around five miles within the the, um, the known hibernacula, and they um, when they emerge, they'll they'll uh, spend time around those five miles for a short period of time, and then migrate out between. Uh, known typically between 12 miles and 168 miles from a known hibernacula to look for roost sites. Summer habitat, typically found in forest stands. It's been known to have been found in, uh, in other caves and mines during the summer or <coughs> man-made structures, buildings, uh, bridges, but it's not typical for the species. They are primarily a, uh, a tree rooster. Reproduction mating occurs uh, during the swarming in the fall. Females um, develop um, eggs in the wintertime, and then the females give birth, birth to uh, one pup from any time between May to the end of June. June. Here in Minnesota, it's, it's uh, typically June and July. Um, it's a, with such a large range for the species, it's, it's kind of been a challenge to, to stick with one date, um, but, but in Minnesota, it's, it's June and July is typically when the, the pups are born, and again, another vulnerable time for the species. They're known to live uh, six to 10 years on average, um, but they have been known to, uh, to live up to 18 and a half years. Very low reproductive rate, um, one pup um, a year, and that's kind of in contrast to 
other species, other mammals, uh, field mice that might have, um, might only live a year, uh, but um, have hundreds, uh, if not more of them, offspring. Uh, the maternity colony, these are the summer locations. Um, they're typically smaller col colonies for this species, so 30 to 60 individuals within one tree. Um, and they are known to switch roofs every two to three days. They do show site fidelity um, and might come back to the same roost locations on and off, um, but they, they do move around within uh, um, a, a limited uh, distance. One of the big issues with the northern longer bat is how much of a generalist it, it is. Um, it's been known to occur in trees down to three inch DBH and um, just about every species that, um, that we would look and find them in. Um, 35 species, I think, is the count that they're currently at. Um, I think they're able to look very unusual records where they've been found in wood piles and I think even in telephone poles somehow. Um, but I haven't really received details on what those conditions were like. Um, but this is one of the first general species that we've listed in, in, in our area. Yes. Um, just a question. Uh, I don't want to get you off track, but um, <clears throat> what is it that they're looking for in, in a tree? Or do they, do they um, nest in the burgundy, the furrows between the, 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 the cracks within the, or do they roost in smooth uh, side? Because if you have a bur oak, you can have a bur oak that's you know, three inches in diameter and might have um, cragginess, whereas a, a trembling aspen might not have cragginess out to about you know, 10, 12 inches. Right, yeah, they, they look for any available spot. Um, it's usually loose bark, um, but if it's a, a snag, a crack, crevice, um, anything where they can tuck themselves in to be uh, protected from the elements. Um, but, but certainly smooth uh, bark aspen, um, those are areas where we had, um, as an office, kind of ruled out the, the likelihood that, that that was habitat, but it still needed to be assessed, um, at least under the interim rule, um, to, to make that determination. The species usually selects uh, about 10 to 53 uh, percent of their roosts in live trees based on studies. Um, I think for many other bat species, they usually rely more on snags, which are easier to identify out in the landscape. Um, and again, uh, typically the, the roosting size is uh, 3 inch to, to 28 inches. Diameter breast height, that's um, uh, the measurement um, in inches at uh, breast height. Uh, research has shown varying amounts uh, of uh, canopy coverage. Uh, they usually like dense forested stands. Um, females um, tend to like more open areas, and, and that's uh, a factor, I think, for the roosting um, location to get more thermal benefit, um, get more sunlight on uh, the trees themselves to help them uh, conserve more energy so they don't have to uh, warm themselves up as much once they come out of the day or Thursday. They forage, they glean and hawk uh, insects off of, typically off of vegetation. So they rely more on dense canopy stands and, and maybe less on very corridors where they might be catching insects in flight. Um, they feed primarily on moths, beetles, flies, and spiders. Uh, migration, it's not known to be a, a long distance migrant, um, but we have recorded them between 12 and 168 miles. Um, with the interim rule, we looked at um, typically 50 miles to be more the distance that, that we anticipated. Um, but even in Minnesota, we have uh, known northern longer bat locations that are greater than 50 miles from uh, known high to half of them. I think we have a pretty good handle on the state of where those locations are. The uh, 
at roosting areas, typically 25 acres in size. Um, that's the smallest area that's been known to um, support a maternity colony. And this was uh, actually in uh, New Jersey, I believe, in an urban rural in interface. We really don't have a whole lot of data to, um, to determine if that's the smallest amount of, of habitat that um, the species would require. Um, there's actually very few no trees that, that have been recorded for the species. Um, as an office, we were using um, kind of one acre as our minimum threshold. And, uh, I'll, I'll probably get into that a little bit later when I discuss uh, the interim for you. Primary threats, um, certainly white nose syndrome is the biggest threat to this species. Human disturbance is also uh, a factor that's been under consideration um, in within high vernacular, in particular uh, commercial and recreation use of those sites um, is a concern, um, and partially, um, possibly the, the the reason for some of the spread of white nose syndrome across um, the landscape from the, the fungus being moved by, by cavers and, and other people going in and out of these cave systems. Um, second, uh, the human disturbance certainly is a, a secondary threat compared to white nose syndrome. The spread of white nose syndrome, it was first detected in New York in a single county in 2007. It's a characteristic uh, fungus that grows within the cave system and will grow on the muzzle, uh, the, the, uh, um, the nose and wing membranes of the bat and produces a very obvious white, um, white coloration around infected individuals. This is the current spread of white nose syndrome, 2015. During that time, it was a pretty steady, constant uh, progression um, westward um, of one infected colony after another after another. Um, in yellow, we have the known hibernacula that is tested positive for the fungus. Um, Pseudomonas uh, destructans. Um, actually, I think they changed the scientific name on that and less familiar with uh, what they're now calling it. White nose syndrome in red are those areas where the disease, the syndrome, has actually presented itself in bat species. Um, typically, it's a three year delay um, from what's been seen from the, the first onset of the fungus and then when you start seeing mortality. Early uh, estimates at the time of listing. Put this together in a slide to show what the, the population, how the population is changing once white nose syndrome started causing mortality. And you can see for northern long your bat, we were losing 96 uh, to 99 percent of the population in each infected uh, cave system. And that was also um, collaborated with, uh, with uh, summer surveys, which might actually be a little bit more. Um, trustworthy to determine numbers. Um, so we're <coughs> seeing the same amount of de decline in the number of uh, captures and uh, mismets. Um, and there's many other species that are affected uh, just as much as the, the northern long eared bat. Um, but the, the little brown at the moment is, is still the, the most common species um, and has a greater range than the northern long eared bat. Um, so the, the, this species one that kind of jumped out as needing the most immediate uh, um, needs for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, it's actually been a relatively quick path to listing for this species. Um, it was first started, uh, we were actually petitioned in 2010, and we put together a rule, um, I believe, in this case, after a lawsuit of not acting in a timely fashion, 
um, in 2013. So a two-year process from once we initiated. Um, it might seem like a long time for, for um, most people, but I think typically listing process, um, it, it goes through five, 10 years. Um, we just listed a butterfly species that have been on a, the candidate list for listing um, for at least a decade until we start the listing process. So in January 2015, we proposed the, the, the rule, and in April we determined that the Northern Lanyard bat should be listed as threatened under ESA with an interim 40 rule. And that's about the time that it hit the radar of, of every blogger, um, state agency, private individual. Um, I had uh, people contacting me from the core that all of a sudden realized that they needed to figure out how to do Section 7 coordination, um, which they had never even considered that possibility in the past. Um, it's been a long process through that interim 40 rule, uh, but most recently in January of this year, we published the final 40 rule, which um, is quite different than the interim that caused uh, such a stir. <coughs> so what is a 40 rule? It's the Section 4D of the Endangered Species Act, which allows Fish and Wildlife to define protections for the species listed as threatened and only as threatened. Um, it allows Fish and Wildlife to focus those protections on um, only those activities that are necessary and advisable for the consumer of the species. Um, and it can't be applied to species listed as endangered. It, the interim that uh, was released last year um, provided uh, broad prohibitions against uh, incidental take. Um, but we did allow for some activities to be covered under the 40 rule and either bypass or go uh, along an expedited route through ESA consultation. And these were forest management practices, uh, maintenance and limited expansion of transportation right of ways, prairie habitat management, and areas with limited tree removal, which was defined as less than one acre. Uh, so anytime you have these activities, um, the the, the interim rule um, told the, the applicant, um, primarily non-federal parties, that they were free to move forward with their project as long as they weren't impacting um, known bridge trees or hybrid activity within a specified time frame. Everything else needed to go through ESA consultation and create quite a, a backlog that usually ended up on my desk. Final 40 rule is a streamlined version of uh, interim, um, which I think everyone can agree it's easier to understand and follow. Um, we certainly had a lot of um, consultants and private parties praise um, how easy um, the new process is to abide under that ESA. So still white nose syndrome is the major, major threat Final 40 rule acknowledges that, whereas the interim put a little bit more focus in the loss of habitat. Um, the vulnerable, vulnerable periods in the bat's life history within white nose syndrome affected areas. Um, the female and young were their known spring staging and fall swarming and hibernation. So the area outlined in orange is the current extent they were recognizing as under um, areas affected by white nose syndrome. And you can see the, the red or the counties that have um, been tested positive for either white nose syndrome or the, the fungus that causes the disease. And you can see that there's not much left of the range that's um, outside of the, the reach of white nose. I guess I'll get a little bit into the definitions um, under ESA that might help understand some of this. Uh, take under ESA is any time um, a listed species is, is harassed, harmed, pursued, hunt, wound, shoot, kill, trap, capture, or collect. And those activities are typically 
not allowed unless it goes through formal consultation and we issue an internal take statement. Uh, purposeful take is when the activity or action is um, is to conduct some form of take, um, but it's the purpose of that activity is to is um, to actually do one of the, the activities described above. Um, typically, what projects deal with is incidental take, and that's where the purpose of their action, um, as long as it's a lawful activity. Um, it's not the purpose to go out and maybe collect a northern lion bat or shoot a northern lion bat, but that activity might still have an effect that needs to be addressed under ESA. Got a question? Yeah. Um, I've heard that rabies can be prominent in the bat population. Can you address that? Because if, if there's a situation where there's a rabies you know, scenario, and then you've got this, now all of a sudden you have health, safety, and welfare coming up against ESA. And, and I know that this has been a theoretical thing, but how how is that going to be addressed? Because that's not just a theoretical thing, that can be an actual thing. Right, yeah, and um, rabies has been documented in, in bad species, for sure. Um, it's probably not as prevalent as most people fear, um, but it is covered. Um, Certainly under the um, interim and the final 40 rule for this species, but I believe um, any listed um, package would probably provide that exemption. It's, it's for the health and safety of individuals, and we see that as, as paramount. Um, if there's any condition where human life is, is vulnerable um, or in danger, um, there's a prohibition uh, or an exemption to allow that take to occur um, so, so it doesn't happen. And, and, and in the case for the interim 40 rule, um, hazard trees, for instance, um, even though it might be a known roost tree, if this was a tree that was about to fall over on somebody's house or on a trail that was heavily occupied or a campground, um, we, that provided an exemption to be able to go and remove that tree regardless of the, the time period. So now with the final 4D rule, um, if you remember back to that map, the entire extent of the range, all purposeful take is prohibited, um, unless it's authorized by a permit that comes out of our office. Um, unless, of course, it's for the defense of, of human life, like rabies, as I mentioned earlier. Um, removal of hazard trees, removing bats from human structures, and limited research permits um, through May 3, 2016, and that's primarily was set in place to handle the backlog. Um, typically, anybody doing research needs to have a permit to handle endangered species, and um, the agency and individuals were just not prepared to have hundreds of individuals have to apply and receive a uh, northern monitored bat permit to be able to conduct, conduct research. So we provided a one-year exemption period from the interim rule. Um, after May 3rd, any individual that will likely become in contact and need to, to handle uh, Northern Lanyard Bat will get a permit from our office or the, it actually come out of the uh, regional office. <coughs> Areas outside of wetness syndrome, um, incidental take is not prohibited. So anywhere where it's um, kind of gray color. Um, you could have any activity at any time period and there's there's no concern. Um, they um, trying to think if we even need to be notified under those conditions. Um, I think we still do um, that the project is occurring but there would never be a situation that I would come back and say, no, you can't do that activity because you're too close to my for that or lose truth. Within that area, uh, within the, the area shaded in red, um, all cave within an armed hibernacle is prohibited. So any activity you're doing inside a cave that's no occupied or in mind that is not allowed. I think most people probably understand that. Um, 
it, not to say it's not allowed, it, it needs to go through the federal process to, um, to uh, make sure those that the take is minimized to the maximum extent practical. So there, there might be conditions where there's cave tours, um, and if they're getting close to known populations of northern line or bat, um, that needs to be addressed under a formal consultation to make sure that that activity can continue. Uh, incidental take caused by tree removal. An in interim rule was a quarter mile. Um, but, well, let me step back up. It's still a quarter mile from any known hibernaculum. Um, anytime a tree is coming down within that time period, at any time of the year, um, we need to be notified. Uh, we'll provide further coordination to determine if it needs to go under the formal consultation path or if there's um, changes that can be made to the, the project scope that would qualify under informal consultation which is basically coming to the determination that your project may affect, but it's not likely to adversely affect the, the species, the population, um, or the uh, individual. Tree cuts, um, tree removal, in the interim rule, used to be protected um, from a quarter mile of any known occupied maternity roost tree. But now we've reduced that to only 150 buffer, uh, 150 foot buffer, around maternity trees and only during the puff season. Um, before it was April 1st to September 30th, now it's just June 1st to July 31st. Uh, so if you have a no tree, which there are not many of them, um, you can't cut it in June and July, um, but if for whatever reason you need to get in there um, in August, you can cut it down and um, that would not be Consider taint under the Endangered Species Act with this 40 year rule. Pardon me, Andrew. Yeah. I, I was just wondering, since so much of this hinges on the hibernaculum information, I, I know that the Minnesota DNR was doing some telemetry work that went along your bath over the last year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, has the Fish and Wildlife Service been working with the DNR? Because if you look at the natural heritage data set, the hiber known hibernaculum uh, points are they're few and far between. So, you know, part of that would be getting more updated information. So I was wondering, are, is there any other survey or additional work being planned to help identify some of these hibernacular areas? Um, we certainly provide funding to the states um, under ESA um, through Section 6 that provides opportunities for continued monitoring and research. Um, I was hoping to contact um, I was going to have a meeting with Gerda for other, um, she's a bat biologist for Minnesota DNR, and I was going to ask her about this, but to my knowledge, um, I don't believe that there's an active effort to locate new uh, known hibernacula. Um, I think we probably have a pretty good idea of where those known locations are. Um, there, there might be efforts through U.S. Forest Service and, and maybe potentially uh, DNR through their own funding sources, but I, 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 I can't think of anything that Fish and Wildlife is currently funding for that purpose. Um, but um, that data is available through the State Natural Heritage Inventory Database, and all those known locations, and if you have a license to that, um, you can get those specific locations um, during four-year project review, um, oftentimes you need to contact Minnesota DNR to get any known rare location within a mile of your project area anyway. And you might get a list that comes back saying whether or not Northern Longyear Bat or any other listed state or federal species is within um, that distance. And we provide um, on our website the, the location of the heritage inventory, um, at least the states across the range. Uh, Minnesota <laughs> is um, we're very fortunate that the Minnesota DNR is pretty proactive and have, has published a known roost and hibernacula map up on the web um, down at the township level, which I think is sufficient for probably 99, if not more, percent of the, the projects that people are going to be working on. And this is the map. Um, it's something that's pretty easy to Google if you just type in NLEB um, roost locations, Minnesota. Um, you'll get a link to this map. Um, this one's uh, a little out of 
a date. It was June of last year. Um, but it identifies areas, townships, where we have no roost trees, high vernacular, and um, I guess we don't actually have a township that has both um, within it. Um, but there are not many records out there. And this is actually an overestimate because at the time of the interim rule, it was um, written both ways that it was, we were protecting both maternity roost trees and roost trees in general. Um, so many records within these uh, brown townships may be locations that were collected from telemetry. So the tree was never identified as species and that no longer qualifies for a definition um, of a roost tree. Um, so this map will get smaller and I'm working with Minnesota DNR to get that updated and, and put it back um, on the web. There's also a, a, a listed table um, that has the township section, well, the, the township number and the, the, the name of that township um, for easy reference. The, uh, the, this new framework under the final 40 rule provides streamlined consultation. Um, it's gone through the programmatic inter-service process and we've developed a final biological opinion for publishing, for releasing the 40 rule. Um, so anytime that there's take um, that's going to occur, a biological opinion needs to be written, um, a biological assessment typically for private parties, we re review that and come up with our biological opinion. In this case, since we were the ones doing the federal action, we had to do a biological opinion on our own activity to explain that, the, that our action was not going to jeopardize individuals, um, the population, um, or the species. Um, that's also available on our website. If you go to Midwest um, in LEB, I think I have a couple links throughout um, the PowerPoint on how to get that information. Um, but we have assessed um, what what those impacts would be to the species by using these, these new rules, um, by allowing tree clearing in areas that might occupy, be occupied by northern laundry bat, and might run the risk of knocking down a tree that's a, that's a hybrid, that's a roost tree that's not known. Um, we calculated the numbers and determined that um, even with the current um, occupied areas, the, the numbers just don't add up and it's gonna be a significant impact to the species. White nose syndrome is the, is the primary threat and should be the focus of the agency um, to try to find a solution to that um, before we try to protect habitat that we, we don't believe um, is, is limiting. So now, um, under the interim, you still need to make a determination may affect um, not likely to adversely affect or may affect likely to adversely affect um, if you're a federal action but now under this new 40 rule you just have to make a determination that the project may affect but take is not prohibited so the only time that you run the risk of take now is if you're doing any activity within a quarter mile of a known high vernacular or 150 feet of a known roost tree in june and july um, so really the quarter mile, I think, is, is what the issue is going to be. But it doesn't take it doesn't take much to go out a quarter mile. Um, I don't think it's really going to overlap with, with any of your projects um, that, that you might be involved in. Um, but, but certainly, it's something that should be a consideration as we move forward. Um, and if if the species is ever a listed endangered species, the uh, 40 rule goes away. We might have to come back to the same. Uh, timing restrictions that we were operating uh, previously. Uh, but now with this new determination, it can come in any form, written or an email to our office, and we have 30 days to respond. And if we are concerned or it's a long determination, we will notify the individual or federal party um, that it's not correct. Um, otherwise, if 30 days passes and you have not heard from us, um, the uh, the determination from our end is that we concur um, and you can move forward without anything from us. And that's 
really imperative given the workload that we're currently under. Um, we can't really as respond to everybody that needs a, um, um, uh, us to double check, triple check, and quadruple check uh, that uh, they're following everything appropriately. But we have very easy guidance that is available on our website to follow some step-by-step -step for whether you're a federal action or non-federal action and how to interpret the 4G rule and what needs to be provided to our office. This is the, um, the location, um, the, the web address for um, everything northern along your path. It includes the federal register rule, the biological opinion, um, any maps, any survey guidance, um, anything that you might have to, um, to, to look at to, to come to these determinations. So again, white nose syndrome is the only range-wide threat um, that we're really looking at. Um, based on our biological opinion, the populations were healthy before white nose syndrome, and it only declined once white nose syndrome presented itself. It's an extensive range for the species, um, and they use a variety of habitat types, which makes it difficult to try to protect, protect a certain habitat area. Um, and it's not like, if, if you're familiar with the Indiana bat, um, there's certain tree species that's the primary roosting area. Um, and, and we could really focus on um, protecting that area, and that made a big difference, but it's just not feasible to protect every tree greater than 3 inch EDH in the state of Minnesota or Wisconsin. Um, and we acknowledge that it's a small percent of forested area being impacted each year. Um, so the risk is relatively low um, that any activity is actually going to take, take a northern line of map. I mentioned that the broad habitat protections were impractical. Um, and post white nose syndrome, um, because it's such a dramatic decline, those indiv ind individuals that are left are much less likely to be impacted by human activities. Um, there's just not enough on, on the landscape to, that you run the risk of cutting down a tree that's, that's going to, to kill one of these remaining bats. This came from our biological opinion. This kind of identifies the number of known hypernacula in Minnesota and Wisconsin and our known loose trees. Um, these are the individual trees that are identified species. So still not that many when you consider the entire area um, for both those states. Um, White nose syndrome has started presenting itself in Wisconsin and we are starting to see declines, but not enough to quantify what um, percentage loss is for the population. Minnesota, we still only have presence of the fungus and we have not seen any, um, any deaths related directly to that fungus. Um, based on the research studies that have occurred up to this point, um, anytime someone looks for bats misnetted, um, we were getting a 58% occupancy rate, so half the time that they looked, they found um, species. So it is it is prevalent in the, in the state. Um, we use that information to estimate the number of maternity colonies and the number of the percentage of habitat that those maternity colonies um, reside on. And, and those numbers are kind of used as a determining factor um, to, to explain why uh, these decisions under the 40 rule weren't likely to to um, reduce this number enough to be a, a concern. Our highest priority is to continue the, to find a solution to white nose syndrome. Um, we've been working with state and, and uh, Canadian provinces to uh, try to identify the, the disease, monitor the population, um, the meeting the response. And there's been many new advancements that seem promising uh, treatments that might actually 
help prevent Sloden Weissman syndrome. Uh, most recently, there's a bacteria that's been identified that can inhibit the, the fungus from spreading. And this is something that we might be able to apply in a air, um, in a whisked uh, fashion within a cave system. Um, the bats could simply pass through and uh, might be enough to, to stop the spread. But I imagine there needs to be a lot more research to make sure that that activity isn't impacting other um, organisms that, that make up the cave environment because it's, it's a very sensitive environment. Um, we're actually going out next week um, to look at some caves to monitor the spread of white nose syndrome and this was um, a few in the office that went out um, a year or two ago to look at a, a cave up north it's been known to have um, northern line or bat. Biologists typically go in uh, very remote parts of these cave systems and swab and, uh, individuals to see if the uh, fungus is on the, the bat itself or present in the environment. Uh, we still have conservation priorities to develop these methods to stop white nose syndrome. We still recommend monitoring populations in summer habitat, um, improve those techniques, expand research, uh, protect known hibernacula, which is uh, something that's, that's, that um, is still protected under ESA. Um, that's, that's the primary area that we need to protect. Um, everything else is kind of more a uh, recommendation, um, a strong recommendation, even though we don't have the regular authority to to enforce that. Um, some agencies may choose to still conduct surveys. Um, this could be to uh, benefit the project, um, to just simply understand the habitat use and distribution of the species uh, and evaluate the threats and impacts. Uh, certainly if, if the status of the species changes, that information would be very useful to um, help the project move forward, uh, but currently under the 40 rule, um, you, you can, surveys are not required. And if anybody is interested in survey guidance, it's also available on our website and uh, we direct um, individuals over to the Indiana Bat survey guidance. Um, additional voluntary conservation measures. You can still con conduct true removal activities and prescribe burning outside of the puff season and outside of the active season. Um, it would certainly benefit the species. Um, it just wouldn't be a factor in uh, causing, uh, reducing your chance, I guess, for prohibited takes since we now um, allow that thing to occur. Um, Avoid clearing of suitable spring staging habitat, false forming within five miles of the radius, but again, only a quarter mile is something that actually needs to be enforced under ESA. And those time periods is April 1st to, to May 15th for the swarming period, and August 15th to November 14th uh, at the uh, tail end of the hibernation period. But, um, but again, if you're within a quarter mile, it doesn't matter the timing of the year. Uh, any activity needs to, um, we, we need to be notified of that and we'll, we'll help move through the process to determine what additional actions need to occur. Um, perform bridge maintenance work outside of the active season, again, not required. Uh, minimize the use of herbicides and pesticides. Um, we haven't, there have been some studies that, that um, don't appear to have any population limit of those, but it's certainly something that could affect the species. Um, outdoor lighting can affect, but again, not, not reduce the population in any meaningful way. Um, and any opportunity to participate, uh, uh, try to provide ways of like, finding a solution to white nose syndrome, um, that's something we, we still stress to our federal partners. So, I guess with that, if there's any uh, Northern Laundry Bat questions, um, I guess I'll, I'll do one more slide. Just, uh, um, I mean, this, this was definitely an eye-opener for the, the state of Minnesota, how much um, work needed to be done 
for such a generalist species. Most of our species are very limited areas, and um, we know how um, how to avoid those activities, or it simply didn't occur often enough that it's going to be a factor in people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, but we have many other species that are um, experiencing uh, significant declines. Uh, rusty patch bumblebee, I'm currently working on um, a listing package. That's a generalist bee species that really just needs flowering nectar sources throughout the growing season. Um, so a similar range of the northern lion bat. Um, I, I think it's actually a 30 state, um, present in 30 states, but it's been reduced to probably four or five um, or very few locations. Um, but if this was a species to be listed, it, it's something that might cross over for the communities and might need to be addressed unless we go direct for the route. Uh, modern butterflies caught a lot of attention recently. The species is declining in its winter habitat, and the bee populations have decreased uh, enough to be a concern. That plant is the only uh, species that the monarchs will lay their eggs on a patch of larvae. Wood turtles currently under uh, consideration for uh, for listing. Uh, might be present in wetland areas. Two more bat species, which are also affected by whitetail syndrome. Uh, and blind means turtle, although I think um, recent reports seem to be the population is doing a little bit better uh, in our area for, for that species. But with that, uh, any questions anybody has, I'll be happy to answer. You're asking how likely it was for individuals to move forward with voluntary recommendations for, for conducting surveys and the uh, tools to help that, um, that process. Right. Yeah, if you have any, I mean, if you have, since surveys aren't required, do you have any mechanisms for encouraging people to, to do them anyways, other than just the general out of the back diligence? No, um, unless we are providing funding directly for that purpose through our state partners. Um, we, it's, it's simply a recommendation. Um, we do offer guidance for that um, process on how to occur. I imagine some uh, fish and wildlife properties may still survey for the species on refuge lands. Um, I really don't think it's going to be something that most projects are going to continue with. And I've had actually quite a few projects that have committed to surveys that, that simply determine that there's no longer the need to spend the money and that's 